Hi everyone, this is Shane O'Grady from AccountancySchool.ie and this presentation is going to address one of the more awkward topics on P1, that of insider or family dominated governance systems versus outsider governance systems. So insider and family dominated governance systems versus outsider governance systems is a peripheral topic. Um, it's only been asked three times 21 exams. However, it is on the syllabus uh, and was asked in question one most recently. Uh, so this presentation aims to introduce the topic as per the syllabus requirements. Uh, we want to review the three questions to date, focusing on the marking scheme as part of the exam technique, explain the theory, illustrate the theory with some examples, uh, prepare you for the June 21 sorry, June 2015, question 1A, which is one of the questions done on the revision course. So the syllabus states that uh, we have to be able to describe and analyze the different models of business ownership that influence different governance regimes, for example, family firms versus joint stock company-based models. Now let's quickly translate that. Family can mean literally or figuratively um, and can also be referred to as insider dominated and I'll go through that in more detail later so it doesn't have to be literally brothers and sisters and parents and children um, etc and the family uh, relationship or the familial relationship can be can be uh, different uh, to a literal uh, family relationship and secondly joint stock company is really an academic term uh, for what we would kind of commonly refer to as um, a, a listed company a company where there are uh, shareholders and still in the US you would hear maybe the term stockholder uh, more than shareholder so the past paper question to date uh, 2010 and 2012 coincidentally on both occasions was question 4a um, and I know some people might take the view, oh, well, if that was the case in that exam, uh, because this is a peripheral topic and I wouldn't have spent much time in it, um, I'm just not going to do that question. Well, unfortunately, that might mean then you, you can't do the rest of the question um, in, in that case. And that might be, you know, a very nice uh, question. So the other 15 marks on both of those occasions might have been quite doable. And therefore, if you weren't able to score any marks uh, for the um, 10 marker, you know, that would be a very high price to pay. Then most recently, there was a very high price to pay if you weren't able to perform, you know, adequately um, on this uh, topic because it was in question one and straight away now you're setting yourself a maximum of 40 um, in question one um, if, if you weren't able to, you know, deal adequately with this topic. So. With now four sittings a year, uh, this topic hasn't been asked in five sittings, and you know that's the equivalent of two and a half years using an old metric. And um, so, uh, and, uh, and the assumption that every so often a topic is kind of due to be asked again, almost on the basis of rotation. You know, this is a topic that we wouldn't be surprised if it was to appear on an exam in the near future. So very quickly, just to look at the two questions um, that have uh, started before we look finally at the third one, which is be our concentration, because that's the one that we'll be looking on in revision. Um, you can see again something that I've spoken about time and time again on the main course. Um, it looks like it's one question, but it's actually two. Why is that? Because there's two question verbs. And you mustn't fall into the trap of saying, well, it's 10 marks, there's two verbs, it's five marks each. So remember the whole issue that I've explained time and again about cognition, or if we can use a more colloquial term in the same way we might talk about horsepower in terms of effort, we might talk about brain power. So it takes an awful lot more brain power or cognition to use the ACCA's official term to explore the governance issues of a family or insider dominated business in contrast to explaining how a family or insider dominated business differs from a public listed company. So on that basis, there's only two marks for the explanation. And then there is um, eight marks, which you would break into four pairs of two uh, for exploring the issues. Um, and again, using evidence from the case. So not just what the issues are in general, which you need to be aware of, but which ones specifically apply to this case. Now, one last thing before I leave this slide, 
just please be aware that we always look at explain as a three marker and then we have to make a judgment call typically on do we basically downgrade it to a two or do we upgrade it to a four it wouldn't make sense here for it to be three marks because you'd have then a, this peculiar type of a marking scheme three marks for explain and seven for explore and that just doesn't fit neatly into the typical way that the um, the acca do this so in this occasion as it turned out it was two marks for explain now i'm going to be fully honest and transparent about this pardon the pun um that's not the way i would have interpreted it i would have thought that the explain in this context might have been actually four marks um, and then you would explore the governance issues and you would basically explore three specific issues in detail for two marks each but look you know you're never going to 100 percent be able to guess the marking scheme in the exam but even if you're hitting 96 or 97 percent that is a huge amount greater than the vast majority of ACCA students throughout the world who would it appear the marking scheme and kind of trying to figure out how, what, how much effort you allocate uh, to the different verbs and what the verbs are specifically asking you is something that's not on their radar at all and um, so this is a little bit unfortunate but we do know this is that you know nine times out of ten or even maybe a better thing would be like you know 49 times out of 50 we're able to guess exactly what the marking scheme is there's always an anomaly along the way and in my opinion this would have been one of them okay and um, the second question then a um, little bit more straightforward in the marking scheme but there was some confusion here about what the examiner actually asked you to do and what his intention was so he asked you to compare and if we take the literal understanding of what compare mean compare means similarities and we often in everyday conversation confuse compare with contrast so when i might ask somebody that has moved to london and they're working in london um, and i might ask them what i want to ask them is you know well how do you find it how do you find um, it, it different how is it different to dublin and in everyday colloquial conversation i might i might accidentally say how would you compare london uh, with dublin and if they were to answer me literally they might say well they're both capital cities they're both english speaking um and you said no 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 sorry what i meant was you know what's different and they might say well you should have said to me contrast so that's actually what the examiner believe it or not intended he didn't want you to try and explain how the governance arrangements of family business uh, and a listed company are similar because they're not uh, that's the whole idea behind this syllabus topic they are significantly different um, and that is the um, the issue that applies here uh, so it's uh, really a little bit unfortunate what he meant for you to do was uh, effectively contrast or you'll notice in the most recent question and um, he basically uh, corrected this mistake and I think we can call it a mistake without it being controversial uh, by then asking you to distinguish between the governance arrangements of a family um, uh, business and a listed company so that was the intention if you even look you know it's quite layering actually if you look at the marking scheme um, and uh, you look at, at that at the end of the, the solution to this question you will see that there's actually four marks allocated for uh, you know adequately contrasting uh, one against the other so that's a little bit unfortunate but anyway um you know it this would have been taken into account when the uh, examining team would have corrected the first um you know sample of scripts that they they uh, do and they would have adjusted the marking scheme and issued instructions to correctors to take that on board so you know two points to emphasize here are crucially important first of all if the acca does ever make a mistake they very rarely make it a second time and secondly when they do make a mistake they do actually bend over backwards to make sure that it doesn't unfairly uh, adversely um, impact on on, on students uh, and i would imagine that's exactly what happened in this situation too okay so this is the question that we need to focus on uh, the most uh, the reason for this is uh, one of the initiatives that we do on the revision course is we do an entire question one over the duration of the revision course just to give people uh, a very definitive and real benchmark as to what we required when tackling that big 50 mark question uh, at the beginning of the exam now when i say beginning of the exam of course my advice is that you actually do question one out of section a last and you do your your section b first but notwithstanding that um, this is a question we will be doing on the governance part of the course or sorry uh, on the governance part of revision 
um, and it's proved to be very popular with students uh, since I started doing this. Um, and in this question, there are some governance questions, as this is a topic. There are some risk questions or some ethics questions, and they differ in uh, the amount of challenge. Some are easy, some are medium, some are hard. The only reason this could be classified as a harder topic is not the complexity, but I suppose the peripheral nature. Um, as I said at the outset, it's only been asked three times out of 21 exams. Um, a lot of students wouldn't have maybe allocated much effort to it, but there is you know, a, a very fundamental difference between allocating not, not too much effort to it and somebody deciding to allocate none. And again, I go back to you know, the front of my hint sheet, um, straight out of a technical article authorized by the ACCA, uh, where you were given very, very good advice by a very experienced um, ACCA corrector and tutor, where he said, you know, you do not need to know 100% of the course to 100% proficiency to pass. There is 60% of the course that you need to have 100% proficiency, and you must know something, and that's critical, something, not nothing, something about the other 40%. So um, this topic would fall into that category. It is peripheral um, and it is one that sometimes frustrates us. We prefer to see the more traditional ones that we like, you know, something like dealing with agency or rules versus principles or the chairman and CEO or non-executive directors or the various committees. But, you know, those topics, you know, there'll be a couple of those on the paper, but from the governance um, side of things, because it's such a broad syllabus, there will be some of these uh, elements as well. So let's look at this very specifically. We know from going through the main course that distinguish is a very specific meaning. And typically distinguish is always two and two. Briefly distinguish would be one and one. And remember my advice, um, when you're doing distinguish, it has a very precise meaning. It means describe A and then describe B, but describe it in such a way that you clearly illustrate to me what the differences are between A and B. So the technique I recommend for people is when you have completed the first task, which is, let's say, to describe a family-owned company, to then switch from describe to distinguish Start your next description of a publicly listed company by saying, in contrast. So force yourself to describe a publicly listed company, not just in a general way, which would be accurate, but in a way in which it illustrates the clear differences, the stark differences between it and a family-owned company. So that's the first part here. And again, if you are a student that prepared properly for P1, and there are certainly some topics that you're going to allocate far more effort to, but you did allocate some effort to this. You knew something about this topic. Well, then in that situation, you would be able to score, in my opinion, all of the four marks for the distinguish uh, requirement. And as you might be aware, an awful lot of people um, who succeed in the ACCA exams, um, you know, they succeed by scoring uh, marks that are pretty close to 50. And um, so four marks, you know, can make a huge difference for a lot of students. Many students, it won't make much difference. They're well up into the high 50s, 60s, and even 70s. But for a very large cohort of students, you know, four marks could be a, a real difference between being successful and unfortunately maybe falling short. Now, the second part of the question here is where the balance of the marks apply. And this occasion, you have to explain or Mr. Mara, in this case study that we will be doing on the revision course, may not have committed the offences he did if Lysis had been a publicly listed company. And one of the exam technique um, tricks uh, or techniques I would ask you to consider here is start with your introductory sentence followed by a colon. So force yourself to ensure that you don't end up going off into a tangent. So start by saying, Mr. Mara may not have committed the offences he did if Lysis had been a publicly listed company because all right and you know we're going to see as we explore this in the revision course because in a publicly listed company he couldn't have had the unfettered powers of decision making that he did within the family owned company where he was the chairman the chief executive a major shareholder the chief bottle washer he was everything um, you know, that just wouldn't happen in a publicly listed company, and therefore he wouldn't have committed the offences that he did. Um, also, we would say, you know, Mr. Marin may not have committed the offences he did if Lysis had been a publicly listed company, because in a publicly listed company there would have been a majority of independent non executive directors on the board of directors to scrutinise and provide um, oversight of Mr. Mara and his decisions and his stewardship of the company. 
And again, you know, that didn't happen in this case because it wasn't a publicly listed company. It was a family owned company and there weren't those checks and balances in place. So that's really what we're focusing on in the second part. So again, I would like to think, you know, that the average well-prepared student not only would have to be nailing the first four marks and definitely getting that, but they, they could perhaps, you know, start making some inroads into the balance of the question and the more difficult component. But like I say, you know, that is something that we will focus on um, in detail because it will be part of us doing this exercise whereby we do all of question one from June 2015 um, on the revision course. Now let's move on to the theory uh, so that we have some of the technical knowledge that's required. So what is this inside our family dominated system? Well, it basically is a, a business where the controlling shareholding is held by a small number of related individuals. Now we look in a few moments that we what we mean when we say, well, they don't have to literally be related, but in most cases they are. Uh, so what we're talking there about is, you know, effectively on that basis, you know, and we'll see some of the advantages, you know, you don't really have a big principal agent dynamic because you know, significant shareholders happen to hold significant positions in the company. They mightn't necessarily, you know, be um, the chief executive or they mightn't necessarily all be directors, but these significant shareholders who are members of this family unit, um, you know, will hold senior management positions. So you don't have the information asymmetry issues uh, that apply uh, with other organizations um, and you don't maybe have, you know, the whole agency issue of, of an agent not acting in the best interest of a principal because in these types of systems they are the one and the same the principal and the agent is the one individual so individuals hold significant shares of senior positions at the company and therefore that allows you to have modest regulatory and accountability duties you know the feeling is is that when you're not exposed to those types of agency issues it would be a kind of an unreasonable uh, burden to place on an organization uh, to, to expect them to have uh, those very, you know, onerous and detailed regu regulatory and accountability duties. And then that then results, you know, that manifests really in kind of what we would call opaque financial reporting. It doesn't need to be as transparent as would happen in a publicly listed company because the public are not exposed to any of the wrongdoing. Now, that can be a little bit maybe naive because the public could be employees of that company or suppliers of that company but in the context of investors and them losing their money you know they're not exposed to that so therefore you are allowed to be a little bit more uh, opaque in relation to your financial reporting okay so let's look at some examples um, a very um, a good example very you know interesting company spectacularly successful company particularly if you took a, a long position on it as an investor over the last number of years would be LVMH Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy um, you'll notice there that there seems to be kind of a, a coincidental a similarity in terms of surnames now it's not a coincidence at all of course um, Bernard Arnault uh, Antoine Arnault and Delphine Ar Arnault are related and the concern there would be is that, you know, obviously you have these family members who effectively will all vote in the one way and support their, their father, um, you know, when maybe some controversial issue might come up at a board meeting or even if something makes it into um, a resolution at an AGM. Um, you will basically be able to count um, on the Arnos basically singing from the one hymn sheet. Uh, and as insiders then they will kind of dominate the organization now it might look like they're outnumbered there on headcount notwithstanding the fact that Bernard Arno is chairman and chief executive which we have a serious problem with anyway um, but if you take a look then in the next portion here we can see the way that the share ownership um, is distributed and the Arnos you know have what we would call effective control uh, of the company so if you take their actual Arno family uh, group ownership and then you take the amount of shares in the company that are held as treasury stock and Bernard Arno as chairman and CEO would have huge influence over how the votes attached to that stock would apply effectively the Arnos control 47.5 percent of the shares and you know that gives them effective control because the chances that the entire 100 percent of the shares uh, will actually exercise their vote is remote that's number one and secondly even if that was to happen it, it's quite believable that if there was kind of you know a revolt where the other 52.5 percent was all going to vote and they were going to vote against the arnos the arnos would approach some of the institutional investors they'd approach some of the individuals high net worth individuals and they would do some sort of a deal or whatever to secure their support 
So really, you know, uh, this idea, yes, you can say they literally are able to control the company because they don't have over 50% of the shares, but for all intents and purposes, um, they do. So they would be a group of insiders who are actually literally family members related to each other, and they do um, dominate the organization. Now, that can have advantages and disadvantages, which we'll come to after we've gone through a number of examples, just to be clear um, that you're able to answer the first part of the question about you know, what is this insider or family dominated business? You know, could you distinguish it from a, an outsider or a publicly listed business uh, in that context? Okay, another example closer to home would be the CISC Construction Group. I'm sure many of you have seen the CISC sign on, you know, Croke Park, the Aviva Stadium, many of our big infrastructural projects, motorways, bridges, etc. Spectacularly successful Irish construction company. But as you can see here, they maybe have kind of blended the best of both worlds, to use that terrible cliche. So you can see that one of the senior members of the CISC family is the chairman, and then three of the younger members are occupying these director positions within the company. But what they've also done is they've basically maybe incorporated some of the governance structures and characteristics that you'd expect in an outsider system within their arrangements where they have uh, a chief executive who is not a CISC family member, does not own any shares because nobody other than CISC family members own shares in this company. It's not publicly listed. I don't imagine it ever will. And then you also have outside non-executive directors to provide that you know, oversight, that stewardship, that checks and balances uh, to make sure that all shareholders, because you know, the extended CISC family at this stage would be quite large, and it's not just the four individuals on this uh, slide uh, that are the only shareholders. So you know, there has to be this kind of check and balance. So that's an, another example of an insider system, but possibly one where you know, they have decided to maybe incorporate um, uh, elements of what you typically find in a publicly listed or outsider system as well as part of their governance. Okay, the last example, just to illustrate this whole idea, just to be you know, careful about the fact that the next time the examiner asks this, he might do a variation on the theme and slightly change it up. Um, here we have an insider or family dominated organization where it's not literally family members. Uh, so this is a very successful uh, indigenous I Irish IT company called Ward Solutions, um, you know, founded by um, this uh, man here, Pat Larkin, who was an ex-army officer. The chief technology officer is also an ex-army officer. He's somebody that I happen to know, even though it doesn't say in his bio here that he is a former army officer. He is, and I don't think that's something that you know he wishes to keep a secret. So I don't think I'm betraying a confidence there. It would be kind of well known that he's he's an ex-military man. Um, and then if we take a look, you know, two of the other senior managers in the organisation also share uh, this type of a of a background. So there's a kind of a bond. There's a certain value system. There's a kind of a, a shared experience. Yeah, there's a tightness uh, type of uh, an ethos and again on that basis you would say look at this would also uh, qualify kind of as a as an insider or a family uh, dominated system you know you could even have a situation where people would say you know there's a clique within that organization there's a kind of a certain you know cohort or a little cabal of individuals there who all went to a prestigious university, um, or all you know previously worked in a different company, and they are the people that have you know significant shareholdings in the in this organisation, and also significant sway and influence due to the fact that they occupy senior positions within the company as well. So that's just some examples to make sure we're clear about that. So going back now to the insider system, um, we've looked at the characteristics and we should be therefore well able to answer a question which might be define or explain or describe or distinguish. Now, in the context of what the second verb in a question might ask you to do, or indeed maybe the next time this is asked, there won't be what I might call the soft uh, uh, verb initially. It'll be straight into an analyze and assess um, you know, and evaluate, or critically evaluate, we need to look at the specific advantages and disadvantages that apply. So the advantage of the insider system is, you know, effectively you are less exposed to agency. As we explained, in an insider system, very often senior managers, up to and including directors or chief executive, often are significant shareholders and, you know, it, it is quite unlikely that they are going to be acting in a way which is detrimental to their interests as shareholders because they're the one individual. 
Another thing is obviously principles, so shareholders. They can directly impose their values and expectations within the organization because they occupy those senior positions. Um, it can be you know, just a little bit unwieldy and bureaucratic uh, for uh, shareholders in a publicly listed company to be able to do that because maybe they only get an opportunity to do it at an AGM or they have to write a letter and if they gain support from other shareholders. you know, So it, it, it isn't about whether their values and expectations are appropriate or not. It's just that in an insider system, it's easier uh, for you to directly impose them and they don't get diluted or they don't get lost in translation or they don't get bogged down in kind of bureaucratic uh, processes. Uh, it's also easier to reach consensus among shareholders. You could take a kind of a flippant view and say, look, you know, sure, they could meet every Sunday for a family dinner and, you know, kind of have a board meeting uh, effectively and um, when they're having dessert. Now, you know, that's a little bit too flippant, but the idea is it's very easy to kind of bring people together. And because they're part of a family unit, uh, so this is why I was using the one of Ward Solutions, you know, even though they're not literally family, you know, they're, they come from a similar background. They have a very similar maybe perspective on, on um, uh, key issues. Uh, how they would address things like quality and stuff like that, you, you know, so it, you typically wouldn't have, you know, dissenting voices, you would have kind of a, a shared value system. Now, of course, that represents problems when that value system happens to be maybe one that is a bit perverse, um, because where are the dissenting voices? Because the members of that family, uh, effectively, you know, they view things all uh, kind of through the one lens. Okay, so shareholders can often afford to take a long-term view. I suppose a very good example of this recently, one that is speculated about, would be Dunn Stores. Dunn Stores were able to ride out the recession uh, because the only shareholders in Dunn Stores are the Dunn and Heffernan uh, family members, and they don't have institutional investors breathing down their necks, shareholders demanding dividends and earnings per share. And what they could do in the very tough times of austerity is they didn't have to close down any stores, they didn't make people redundant, uh, they didn't inst um, implement pay cuts, and also it could be said they didn't engage in some of the stuff that Tesco got caught doing. Um, now, let's be clear, it, it would appear it was basically, you know, uh, originated from Tesco in the UK and head office. Um, there's an ongoing criminal investigation, that's how serious it is. Uh, and whereas nobody's going to excuse that, you might say, look, it's understandable why they felt that type of pressure, because they're not an insider system. They don't operate in a situation where shareholders can afford to take a long-term view. They have institutional investors like pension funds looking for quarterly returns, looking for dividends, because those investors have to basically pay pensions to their customers. So they've invested the premiums. They need to have an income stream to make them a viable business. And in that context, maybe that would explain why senior managers in Tesco's felt the need or felt the pressure uh, to engage in the practices that they did because they couldn't say to investors, you know, please be patient, you know, it's a recession and what happens is things will bounce back in the future, but you're going to have to accept that there'll be no dividend for the next two or three years. Um, you would imagine that the shareholders in Dunn stores are all very wealthy people in their own right. And if that was the decision by Margaret Heffernan as chief executive, um, first of all, it would affect her uh, because she would be a significant shareholder. But the rest of them might be able to kind of accept that. And, you know, they said, OK, that's what we will do. So, you know, that's one of the advantages. Uh, another advantage then is in the family firm, there is typically, you know, huge levels of commitment. So go back to the CISC example or even go back to the LVMH example uh, with the Arnos. Um, you know, the, the, the family members that are working there, you know, don't view it just as a job or of a fiduciary duty. They have a duty to the family. They have a duty to the family's reputation, the legacy. There's an element of pride in it. You know, the levels of commitment and the determination will be typically very high. And they see that, you know, what they're doing is, you know, they're basically, you know, just, you know, a, a guardian. They're just temporarily there uh, looking after the company. And it's their job to ensure, you know, that they hand it on to the next generation in even a better situation than what they um, got when they when they um, uh, became involved in it so you do have this almost kind of you know fanatical uh, dedication and determination uh, in a family firm and um, that you know 
quite logically and quite understandably you mightn't get that type of you know fanatical passion um you know when you it's not your family your brothers and sisters relying on you you know, you look at the incredibly hard work that your parents did and you just feel you know horribly guilty if you ended up kind of squandering uh, or not making most of the of the effort that they had made now sometimes of course you know that doesn't apply but that's kind of viewed as one of the advantages disadvantages all right obviously if there is this whole idea of family members and we have this issue sure if you can't trust your family who can you trust um, unfortunately sometimes family members have learned to their to their terrible cost that you can't necessarily assume that you can trust uh, other family members and um, unfortunately you know sometimes people don't have the integrity that we would hope uh, greed and temptation can come into play so imagine a situation where you have a family or insider dominated system um, and you have one of the family members occupying the role of C CFO and he is basically abusing that position you know to skim he is skimming profits and um, so he's taking some profits that are undeclared for himself um, and then the other profits he's dividing amongst the other family members, the other shareholders. The reason that might go undetected for a long period is because the other family members trust him or her. And they say, look, it's not just our CFO, it's our brother or our older sister or whatever. And, there's, you know, we can't be checking up on, on him and making sure that he's awarding contracts to the appropriate companies, that he's not, you know, in receipt of bribes, that he's not selling off an asset and failing to declare the actual price that the company received for the asset and, and siphoning off some of that um, money. Um, unfortunately, you know, you are more exposed to this in a, a family or insider dominated system because there is this view uh, that you can implicitly trust family members uh, a second obvious problem then is you know the pride the legacy issue can lead to these organizations feeling that succession planning must come from within the family clique and um, you know that effectively the successor to the ceo has to kind of effectively be one of their children or grandchildren or maybe nieces or nephews and you know that really puts a very um, you know significant limit on the range of people you can pick so maybe the person you're picking uh, to succeed the ceo is not necessarily the best qualified person for the job and unfortunately you're attaching too much value to the fact that they happen to be a member um, of the family and sometimes that doesn't work out um all of that then results in a lack of formal governance structures and committees so you know and that kind of compounds the issue because if you've no nomination committee well then it's very easy for somebody to say you know as ceo i have decided that my successor should be you know nephew x or daughter y and because there's no nomination committee of independent non-executive directors to, to question that or in fact they wouldn't even allow the ceo have an input in that you know that can easily happen Professional disagreements in a family firm become personal feuds. Um, this is maybe where we could go to the flip side. I've used Dunn Stores as an example of a very you know, successful family or insider dominated system operating in Ireland. Uh, but also there would be a very you know, sad and infamous and unfortunate case where many years ago one of the directors of Dunn Stores who um, developed serious problems with alcohol and drugs um was ousted from the company by his co-directors now you know that happens all the time uh, directors will have disagreements and they might decide that a certain director has to leave the organization but in this case it was different because it wasn't just co-directors deciding that a director had to go it was brothers and sisters deciding that a certain brother had to go and you know you wouldn't be human if you didn't take that personally um, and if you've ever seen any interviews with that individual who has, you know, pursued other business interests now outside of Dunn Stores, it's still something that you can tell, you know, he's quite bitter about, he takes it quite personally. Whereas if that was just a number of people involved in some sort of a business venture and they decided to go their separate ways, and let's say it was adversarial, you know, the, the director did feel that they were ousted, um, they would kind of move on. They wouldn't have that lingering uh, kind of, you know, bitterness um, and, you know, awkwardness that can happen. And again, because of that, maybe what also might happen is directors would be slow to bring things to a head. So you might tolerate, um, you know, certain behavior of a co-director that you wouldn't tolerate if he wasn't your brother or sister or a member of your family. Um, you can also have the whole idea of discrimination against minority shareholders. Again, the classic example of this is where you know the matriarch or patriarch within a family or insider-dominated business 
um, has accumulated a, a particularly large shareholding. Uh, you know, let's say if other family members have passed away, they and their inheritance have left the shares to the matriarch or patriarch. So not only are they kind of the, the family elder, and that certainly carries an awful lot of weight, they also happen to be like by some distance the largest shareholder. So that can, you know, re result in situations then where maybe the younger generation who are shareholders, but their shareholding is tiny. In fact, if you accumulated all of that together, it would be still less than what the matriarch or patriarch owns. And, and that can lead to problems because maybe the younger generation coming through, you know, they have a better idea of what the future of the company should be. Whereas the matriarch or patriarch might be kind of set in their ways, they're kind of caught in a time warp. Uh, and on that basis, you know, they are being discriminated against effectively. And the last one then is shareholders can be paternalistic or self-indulgent. Uh, so the whole idea here is you might have a pet project, you might do something based on vanity or pride. So let's say there's a, there's a family or insider dominated business. Let's say it's a chain of hotels and um, it started by, you know, kind of one hotel. So basically the, the grandfather, um, the third generation are in the business. The grandfather founded the company by, um, you know, starting a hotel, let's say, in, you know, somewhere in Cork, in Cork City. Um, as time has gone on, the fabric of the city has changed and um, the area has become a little bit run down. That hotel is no longer popular. The profits are dropping and also it's now even beginning to generate a loss. And at the same time all that is happening, a property developer has approached um, the uh, organization with a view to buying the property and redeveloping it. And out of pride and out of kind of emotion and sentiment, that is refused. Um, you know, the cold, hard commercial reality is ignored um, because of maybe the kind of the sentiment or the nostalgia of the fact that this is the hotel that started the organization. And that's been, you know, paternalistic, that's been self-indulgent, and, um, you know, that type of stuff just wouldn't happen in a publicly listed company. You know, shareholders, institutional investors just wouldn't wear that. There's no way they would tolerate it. And that can be another one of the disadvantages uh, of an insider or family dominated system. Okay, so the outsider system, we thankfully don't have to spend as long on that because that is effectively, you know, every other organization that we have looked at really in uh, the governance part of p1 so we're talking about obviously organizations where shares are publicly traded substantial shareholders are unlikely to hold senior positions in the company so even you know in let's say ireland where independent news and media almost 30 percent of the shares in the company are held by uh, dennis o'brien dennis o'brien doesn't occupy a senior position in that company now if you were to look at his a telecommunications company and um, digicel he does you know he's the chief executive of the organization he's also and um, i think he's probably the only shareholder in it you know but but that's the idea so a publicly listed company you know you do have substantial shareholders and uh, they are typically institutions sometimes it might be high net worth individuals but even if it is individuals they are unlikely to hold senior positions in the company they effectively have agents to do that in their behalf uh, directors, uh, etc., to do it. Um, as a result of the fact that the shares are publicly traded and the public interest needs to be protected, you have then very significant regularity and accountability duties, and that then manifests itself in transparent financial reporting, quarterly earnings statements, a very detailed annual report that must be externally audited, all these types of ideas. So, you know, this is going to help you with the question we do in the revision course because if those are the characteristics that you must have in an outsider system or a publicly listed company, well, then that would go a significant way to explain to you why Mr. Mara wouldn't have got away with what he did get away with if Lysis had been a publicly listed uh, company or an outsider uh, system. He just wouldn't have been able to do the outrageous stuff uh, that he did. Uh, so the advantages obviously of this system is, you know, in, in kind of recognizing the fact that you were exposed significantly to agency issues, which is less the case in the family or insider system, there's much more robust uh, governance. You also don't have really any kind of emotion or sentiment uh, used in the running of the company. It's basically, you know, cold, hard, financial, empirical, uh, commercial uh, perspective. Um, you have a broad distribution of shareholder voting power. You're unlikely to have, you know, this matriarch or patriarch figure uh, kind of dominating the organization. 
um, you are open to outside expertise so you don't back yourself into a corner and say well look you know the you know when we're going to recruit a new chief financial officer it has to be somebody whose surname is um, you know Arno or whatever it might be in, in the case of LVMH you know you're going to say look you know we have to consider the fact that there might be um, much more qualified people to occupy this position outside of the family gene pool um, they are responsive to the expectations and claims of society because again you don't have this kind of you know uh, family um, dominance and the family might view things in a particular way um, and you know often if you know a family you know wants to maintain that which they're perfectly entitled to do, that's one of the reasons that they will not go public because they know they will they will basically lose that they won't be able to do it their way they will have to take into account what shareholders want uh, in, in that context and then the last thing is you know there's no love um, uh, you, 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 when you view how somebody is performing within the organization um, you're not going to have your judgment colored by the fact that it's your son or your daughter or your niece or your nephew uh, that you're, you're evaluating um, you're the CEO and you're going to evaluate how did your head of sales operate you're the CEO you know how did your head of marketing operate how have they done in the last uh, reporting period um, you know there's going to be no love or no sympathy or no kind of you know extenuating circumstances it's going to be you either performed or you didn't perform and and, and it's felt that you know that is a kind of a more honest and more efficient way uh, to run an organization now there obviously are disadvantages with the outsider system you know hence why we have p1 as a subject um, because of the fact that there is agency now with agency comes robust agency safeguards in the form of corporate governance but once you have agency you have conflict of interest you have greed you have temptation you have people not maybe with the best of integrity um, you know and again you're less likely to have uh, people in family or insider dominated systems behaving um, against the interests of shareholders whereas it, it's a constant worry and a constant threat uh, with uh, publicly listed or outsider systems um, as I mentioned previously, the Tesco example would perhaps be a great example of, you know, what can go wrong because the pursuit of short-term strategies at long-term expense. Um, look, we don't know, but I don't think it's unreasonable for us to, su to suggest that the motivation might have been, you know, to keep institutional investors off your back, uh, to try and basically massage the figures to suit what analysts would accept and so forth. And, you know, rather than, you know, as an insider family dominated system, that wouldn't have to be disclosed. Um, you would be able to have a kind of a, your board meeting would effectively be a family meeting. You would sit down, you would say, here's the state of affairs. There's going to be no dividend for the next while. Profits are almost kind of flatlining. And we're going to have to basically wait until we can kind of, you know, uh, effectively, you know, ride out this particular storm. So that's unfortunately one of the things that can happen with the, the publicly uh, listed or outsider system is that one of the big disadvantages is that, you know, people in the organization will be under pressure uh, and will be tempted uh, to do the quick fix, uh, the quick buck, and that can come back to haunt that company and damage its reputation. I suppose in, in recent times as well, the Volkswagen issue uh, would be another one. It would be interesting to, to contrast maybe Volkswagen against, you know, car companies, um, particularly maybe some of the of the kind of exclusive uh, kind of bespoke luxury brands they wouldn't be under that pressure where you have to imagine the reason that the, the volkswagen engineers uh, cheated or developed this way to cheat the emissions test was because of targets because of profits because of the short term and, and you wonder you know how long will it be uh, so the long-term expense of this will be huge how long would it be before people will have forgotten about what Volkswagen did uh, in relation to cheating those emissions tests okay agents are not personally invested in the company and I suppose you know that can maybe take the view that in contrast to the, the family or insider dominated business you know they're not invested and uh, they're not emotionally invested they're not maybe as fanatical and passionate uh, they might be you know kind of a little bit um, you know laissez-faire they might kind of you know get there and they you know they tip along nicely they do what they need to do but they're they're not kind of you know putting in 100 percent effort you know no they might be putting in 85 
uh, they are putting in you know a good 60 hour week etc um but maybe they're 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 not as invested and determined and there isn't the family reputation and legacy and stuff like this that isn't in their in their um their mindset when they're when they're working in the organization and then obviously uh, another big disadvantage but you know it's just necessary you can't ignore it is the higher agency um uh, costs um, because of the fact that you have agency issues, you can't just stand idly by and do nothing about it. It'd be like, you know, a company that basically has, you know, issues with shoplifting um, and it, it starts moaning about the fact that in order to address those issues, it has to put in electronic tagging and have a security guard and have CCTV. You know, you, you, you just have to do it. So uh, if you're going to basically have a store with members of the public coming in to buy stuff, well then therefore you are definitely exposed to the risk of 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 theft well if you basically have a situation where you have a publicly listed or an outsider uh, system and you have agents running the company on behalf of principals so you have directors working on behalf of shareholders well then you are exposed to conflicts of interest you're exposed to you know agents effectively deciding to put their own interests ahead of that of their principles so if that's the case you have to do something about it you can't just stand idly by and kind of say isn't that terrible so that's obviously one of the uh, of the issues that that applies okay so to wrap up and i hope you didn't lose the will to live um halfway through there all right that concludes the whole idea of the insider um, and family dominated governance systems versus outsider governance systems we'll obviously be doing um uh, a question on that on the revision course as I outlined and remember the idea is, is in order to maybe help you prepare for that what we have to try and do perhaps is in the context of this particular question is look at the advantages of a, an outsider governance system and the advantages are that you have robust governance uh, you do actually open yourself up to outside expertise etc and you know how would those things uh, effectively have prevented mr mara behaving the way that he did the other angle that you might do then is you might take a look at the disadvantages of the insider or family dominated governance system because that helps to explain you know why mr mara did do what he did like you know how was he able to do x and how did he manage to get away with y and why did nobody challenge him about z um, so that's the basic idea. So again, I, I hope you didn't lose the will to live halfway through it. Um, it is a peripheral topic, um, but I would hope in combination with this and the question we will do on the revision course, and that's important for us to not just cherry pick questions and say, look, you know, this is a question one incomplete um, uh, from basically mark zero to mark 50. And even though there are some difficult questions in it, isn't it actually quite doable for a well-prepared student to get a, a, a pass on, on this particular question? And it is. So the hope would be is this presentation, plus doing the question on the revision course, there will be then no requirement for you to spend any additional time of your own private revision on this topic for the exam. Thank you.